This is Newsroom. Hello and welcome from Johannesburg here in South Africa. I'm Eben Janssen. The show is live. It's broadcast from our studios here in Auckland Park. We're also streaming live on YouTube right now with our whole show available on demand on our YouTube channel today. But well, we cross to Lesotho for an update on the latest on the political crisis in that country. We look to the Middle East where Kurdistan is picking up the fight against the Islamic militant group ISIS. And should ETOLs be scrapped and a fuel levy be introduced? Well, we'll find out what happened with the process of submissions that's underway at this very moment. But first, let's get a news update from Katrin Malan. Well, hello and welcome to Newsroom. I'm Katrin Malan and let's take a look at the top stories this morning. Lesotho's Prime Minister could return home today after three days in exile in South Africa. Regional mediators are seeking to reinstall him to power after an apparent coup on the weekend. Factions in the Mountain Kingdom have now agreed to a roadmap to normalize the political situation. The Sadiq Troika announced the breakthrough in Pretoria after a marathon meeting to assist parties in finding common ground. I think that we're trying to reconcile the irreconcilable. There's no way that you will bring the LCD and the ABC back on the table to discuss anything sensible. I think they've had each other uh, long enough. I think they started already with the a, with a wrong footing in that the ideologies are not the same. The Farlem Commission of Inquiry resumes in Centurion Pretoria this morning with lawyers for the families of the deceased cross-examining Lonman Patton Mine Head of Security Henry Blow. The commission is investigating the deaths of 44 people at the mine in Marikana in the northwest during an unprotected strike in August 2012. And former chairman of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts, Gavin Woods, is expected to testify at the Sariti Commission of Inquiry today. Woods, who was an Inkata Freedom Party MP, resigned from his position as chairman of the Key Watchdog Dog Committee in 2002. Moving to Africa, Liberian President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf says the situation over the massive Ebola outbreak in her country remains grave. In an interview, Sirleaf admits that her country's health delivery system is under stress. This while nurses at Liberia's largest hospital went on strike yesterday, demanding better pay and equipment to protect them against the epidemic. More than 1,500 people have died from the highly infectious virus since March. International headlines, the United Nations has agreed to send investigators to Iraq to examine crimes being committed by Islamic State militants on an unimaginable scale. The UN announced yesterday that at least 1,420 people were killed in Iraq in August, but that the casualty figure could be far higher because it could not get independent verification of reports of hundreds of incidents in areas under Islamic State's control. And Ukraine's defense minister has accused Russia of launching a great war that could claim tens of thousands of lives. Russia dismissed the comments, saying they only pulled the Ukrainian people further into a bloody civil conflict. The comments came after Ukrainian troops were forced to flee Luhansk airport in the east of the country amid an offensive by pro-Russian rebels. Now remember, all these top stories are available on our Newsroom Facebook page. You can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Ibn, over to you. Thank you very much, Katrin. The South African development community will send an envoy and an observer team to Lesotho to help restore stability and security there, where military actions caused the Prime Minister to flee the country. The city's ruling parties agreed also to lift the suspension of parliament ordered by the prime minister in June in a bid to restore normality following this alleged coup attempt. Prime Minister Thomas Tabani, his deputy, Motejoa Metsing, and the leader of the third coalition party, party sports minister, Tesele Maseribani, committed to working together to restore stability, according to SADC. The three earlier met with South African President Jacob Zuma and other representatives of the SADC regional bloc in Pretoria yesterday. Now, SABC reporter Ntakwana Nkatane is in Maseru Lesotho to give us the very latest. Good morning. Are you there? Good morning, Eden. Ntakwana, just tell us, ku no ku, what's the latest? 
Well, what is happening in Lesotho at the moment <clears throat> is that all eyes are really on the three leaders. First of all, to see if they actually come back home, all of them, because you will remember that the Prime Minister and the Minister of Gender, who are the Obasutu Convention leader and the DNP leader, left Lesotho on Saturday quite unceremoniously, uh, fearing for their security. And uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, Mutetra Nitsin, left on Sunday for the talks. Now, when the three of them return today, it will be a signal really for people that things are beginning to return to normal because yesterday the police told us that they were afraid to go to work and we know that the army is divided part of it is demanding that uh, the new uh, commander general should not be in power because they still consider the old commander general uh, still in power so these dynamics uh, i think will be confirmed when the three leaders arrive back home today they will give us the signal that things are beginning to return back to normal even has there been any reaction from the military? What are they saying today? Well, they have not said anything today except that yesterday the government came out to issue a statement in which they were calling on the ousted Lieutenant General Sadika Modi to, uh, he, because he remains an important person in, in, in society. They call upon him to respect the laws of Lesotho and to abide by the decisions of what they call the command authority. They were saying that they call on him to use his influence to help defuse the situation in Lesotho and to avoid any further disruption and potential bloodshed. But from the army, uh, we have not heard anything since the statement was issued, and we're still waiting to see really how things turn out. From what I can tell you, people are nervous on the ground. Last night when I was moving around, I saw that uh, people say they're afraid to walk around at night because they don't know what will happen to them since the police are not on duty. So uh, this anxiety perhaps uh, will probably... Uh, settle when the, uh, when the three leaders arrive back home today, even. Power struggles, uh, Mtakwana, has always been part of, or has always dominated Lesotho uh, politics since the 70s, really. Can you give us an insight why this, the politics in this country is, is often so unstable? Well, I I indeed, Lesotho comes from an era, I think, prior to the 1960s of uh, being ruled by chiefs. And you remember that the founder of the Basutu nation was King Moshe I, and the, the, the royalty ha has been quite uh, significant in the running of the country. But um, we saw these divisions when uh, it came independence time in 1965. You saw that uh, the Basutu National Party, which was quite nationalist, as well as the Basutu Land Congress Party at the time, uh, we, we, which was quite uh, liberal in terms of their thinking, uh, the two uh, were the two divisions. And we've seen these uh, pre precipitate over the years. In, the, in 1970, uh, the national leader, the Basutu national leader, Liabua Jonathan, uh, suspended the constitution after the elections, and there was a 20-year drought of democracy until the return in 1993. But soon after 1993, we saw another uh, school where uh, the king uh, with a number of other people then sub suspended again government uh, that was called the palace school and then in 1998 again we saw now a split of the congress parties themselves uh, when when the formation of the Lesotho Congress for Democracy came out of the Basutulan Congress Party and uh, again in 2001 we saw the Congress Party split into what was then the Lesotho People's Congress again in 2012 prior to the elections in 2012 the Congress parties again split uh, into the Democratic Congress the major opposition Democratic Congress now and the Lesotho Congress for Democracy the other uh, coalition partner now what we've seen now in recent months is those parties making a move to come back together, uh, Eben, where they are now threatening this coalition government. And even today, as we speak, we're still not sure if the prime minister feels comfortable that uh, those parties will not come together. When we spoke to the Opposition Democratic Congress yesterday, it was saying the Congress parties control 77 of 120 seats in parliament. And if they come back together, they should be allowed to form government. So these are the dynamics that are happening in Lesotho right now, Eben. Thank you very much for that contribution. That's Ntakwane Ngatane. She is in Maseru at the moment and uh, will keep us updated how things develop in that country over the next 24 to 48 hours. Volatile is the situation and a little bit unstable now. The political outcome in Lesotho will have an impact on other Southern African development or, or the 
development community countries, especially South Africa. President Jacob Zuma has moved swiftly to mediate and quell the volatile situation in the troubled mountain kingdom. South Africa has long-standing and historical, political and trade relationship with Lesotho. Instability in Lesotho also is likely to put pressure on Zimbabwean President Robert Mugabe, who has just assumed the chairmanship of SADC last month. Now, political analyst Livian Doe from the Chwane University of Technology joins us from our studio in Pretoria today. Good morning to you, Levy. Good morning, Eben. Levy, we see that uh, the leaders are said to be on their way back to Lesotho today after fruitful discussions yesterday. What is your expectation in the next 24 to 48 hours? It's a very, very difficult situation in Lesotho, Aben. But I think what is more important now is that the crisis in Lesotho has been going on for some time, and it's time for the leadership of the people of Lesotho to take charge of the situation. The expectation will be that if they are able to come together, find an amicable solution to the crisis in Lesotho, they must then be able to go back to Lesotho and make an assurance to the people of Lesotho to say that they want to promise political stability and ensure that everything in Lesotho has to run smoothly. It might not be easy because there are a lot of people, the supporters on the ground and the general public. But I think it's upon the leaders themselves now to go out and say that we need to bring in stability and ensure that we bring back, we take the differences and put them aside and ensure that there is political stability in that country. What is your opinion? Do you think it's safe for Tom Tabani to return home today? It is not safe, uh, Eben, if you look at the way in which he left uh, uh, the country. But also very importantly is to note that in June, Parliament was suspended and the, the opposition and the citizens of Lesotho were very much patient. And I think now when he goes back, there must be some form of utter, uh, utmost assurance that is going to be very safe and the government is going to be stable. But I think as well, if they go back and then there is instability, it will mean that the political leadership of Lesotho has actually betrayed the agreement that they had that was being facilitated by President Zuma. Would it be fair to classify uh, Lesotho as an unstable country, taking into account the history of this country uh, since the 70s with the kind of turmoil that we've seen? Very few people in Lesotho are the ones that are uh, responsible for the problems that we have. If you look at the general population of Lesotho, it's mainly people that are generally apathetic. They actually respect the institutions and they also respect the leadership that is there. But the biggest problem we face in Lesotho is that if you have got members of parliament and leaders of different political parties are the ones that are mainly involved mm. in this crisis. If you look at the situation... After the, the, uh, the Saturday events, there has been peace and stability amongst the members of society in Lesotho, but the problem is on top, it's with the, with the leadership themselves. I think it's time that the leaders of different political parties must come on board and ensure that the citizens feel safe and they also feel that there is a, a political stability so that they must be able to live their normal lives like other countries. I wanted to ask you about the coup or no coup. The military says it's no coup, but they've gone in and they've disarmed the police. What are your views on that? Well, that one is very, very difficult, Eben. The issue is SADC and the African Union have made it clear that they will never support any government uh, that, that, uh, that is uh, being run in any country that came through a coup d'etat. But also at the same time, if the prime minister and the deputy prime minister and, or the entire leadership of the state is outside the country and the army is in charge, then that one would classify that as a coup. But also, Eben, it's important to note that coup d'etat take different forms. As long as the army is in charge and the elected representatives are not in charge, then one would actually classify that as a coup. But the question would be whether this is going to be the longest coup or whether the, the military is only going to serve until the leaderships come back to Lesotho, that becomes the big question that will, is actually difficult for all of us to answer. And, and the implications of this perceived instability on, on, on neighboring countries and the SADC group, what do, you, what do you see? 
The implications are that, especially with South Africa, Lesotho is a landlocked country and is within. It's a, all the borders of Lesotho are surrounded by South Africa. We trade with, with Lesotho. We rely on the water from Lesotho. But also at the same time, if the crisis in Lesotho is not being properly handled, it will create some form of instability in the neighboring countries. But I think let's, uh, let's give hope that SADC mm. and the mediation by President Zuma will be actual to come up with something much better that will actually make sure that Lesotho goes back to normality. Finally, Levy, what do you expect the economic impact to be on Lesotho with these developments? I think what will be important will be to look at the trade relations and the operations of the borders in Lesotho. If the borders are operating properly and there is free movement of citizens in and outside Lesotho, it might not have a direct impact on the economy. But also, the economy depends on the leadership of the state, whether they they prefer to continue trading with other countries or not. But if they allow the other activities to roll on, as long as they are busy uh, dealing with the challenges that they face, I think it might not uh, negatively affect the economy. But let's hope that things go back to normal in Lesotho so that the economy of the region is not negatively affected. Thank you very much. Livian Doe, this political analyst from the Tswane University of Technology, joined us live from Pretoria, giving us uh, his insights. And he's a man uniquely qualified to do so. Let's take a quick look at what you're talking about on social media. Well, very much Lesotho on people's minds. Zanu says, the turmoil in Lesotho should be resolved by premiers from the neighboring provinces. Pella, it is a small province. That's a little bit arrogant. Aying says, a peace plan has been set in place for Lesotho and SADC will monitor the progress. Road back to peace, peace agreement. Let's hope that it stands. Moreki says, SA government should just take over that province once and for all. Marcus, yeah, uh, people, please. There we have a picture, tweet pictures. Military personnel on the streets. Uh, SADC regional block to send observers to Lesotho, says Redneck. Of course, if you see that uh, military observers very much on the ground or, or military personnel on the ground rather in, uh, in Lesotho. The police have not been seen for days now because they've been disarmed by the military in that country. We'll keep you updated on this very channel throughout the whole day as to how that story developed. Let's take a look now at the front pages from around the world as we go globe trotting. The International New York Times uh, uh, is looking at Kurdish guerrilla fighters who've confronted ISIS in northern Iraq. We take a closer look at that story later when we'll be joined on the show by a Kurdish guest. Then, in Africa, as we move our focus back to Africa, the vanguard in Nigeria saying that African states have declared total war on the deadly Ebola virus. Let's hope they're successful. This comes after the country confirmed a third case of Ebola in the oil hub of Port Harcourt bringing the country's total confirmed infections now to 17. And the Times in Europe has a picture of actress Jennifer Lawrence there, looking at the story of a group of hackers who posted dozens of naked photographs of female celebrities onto the 4chan online forum earlier this week. Well, is that really what the world is interested in these days? Now, looking back in history, this week... In 1939 was the start of the most widespread war in our history. World War II, Germany invaded Poland under the false pretext that the Poles had carried out a series of sabotage operations against German targets. The global war lasted from 1939 until May of 1945 and directly involved more than 100 million people from more than 30 countries in a state of total war. The major participants threw their entire economic, industrial and scientific capabilities behind the war effort, erasing the distinction between civilian and military resources. The scary fact is that Poland has warned Russia that the actions in Ukraine this week could result in another war in the entire Eastern European bloc. Scary indeed if we look back at 1939. You're watching Newsroom on SABC News. We'll be back shortly.
natural village is a large family homestead with 16 huts, each of them with its own specific purpose. My responsibility it is taking care of the family. As far as cleanliness is concerned, I have to make sure that I keep the home as clean as possible every morning when I wake up. That's Kaleidoscope, Sundays, 5.30 p.m. on SABC News. Welcome back. This is still Newsroom on SABC News. Kurdistan, which is a region surrounded by Turkey, Syria, Iraq and Iran, is one of the Middle Eastern areas that has in recent years come under attack by the Islamic State, also known as ISIS or the IS. Now the country's militant organization, the Kurdistan Workers' Party or PPK, or PKK rather, has taken matters into their own hands, currently manning, manning the front lines to help defeat ISIS. Now to tell us more about this as well as a national in initiative to free Kurdish people's leader, Abdullah Ocalan, who has been behind bars now for 15 years. We are joined from Cape Town by Havin Gunessa from the Freedom Initiative. Havin, thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me. Let's start at the beginning of the most current stuff. We see what's happening in Iraq with ISIS and the like. <clears throat> How has Kurdistan been affected by this kind of insurgency? Yes, fortunately, let me start by saying that it's a lovely morning here in Cape Town. And I'd like to say good morning to you, Eben, and also to everyone who's watching us here across South Africa. Um, well... The Kurds thought that the 21st century would no longer bring them um, genocides or, or bloody attacks against them. Unfortunately, as you pointed out as well, um, there has been severe attacks by ISIS um, uh, attempting to ethnically cleanse and also religiously cleanse the region. Now, these latest attacks were not the only attacks by ISIS. There has also been attacks against the Kurds in the Syrian Kurdistan for the past two years. So the Kurdish freedom fighters, whether in Syria, you know, they are called the YPG or the PKK guerrillas, uh, have been fighting off ISIS uh, for more than two years now. So if it wasn't for them, as you put, put it, uh, this would not just be a genocide, but it would be a total cleansing of the region. So there is a huge human um, crisis um, and tragedy. There has been more than two million people internally and externally displaced at the moment. You talk about religious and ethnic cleansing. Uh, there have been analogies made with the SS and the Nazis uh, of years gone by with ISIS. Uh, would this be a fair comparison? Do you see this kind, of, this kind of thing happening? Well, fascism? Yeah, sure. This has every dimension of fascism. I mean, the fact that it is... Uh, making use of um, Islam religion and it is disguising itself under Islam does not change this. When we look at the way it is militarizing the society, when we look at the way they are, you know, um, totally disregarding the weak and they are pushing forth the male hegemony and the rule of the strong, when we look at the way they are treating women, when we look at the way sexual violence is used as a strategic war tool, when we look at women being sold as sex slaves, and the best of them, the one they consider to be proper women, are to only stay at home, yeah, we are talking about fascism here, pure fascism at work. Now, you talk about the PKK leading the fight there in your country against this extremism. Recently... Uh, reports say that the West is mulling a decision to remove the PKK from their list of terrorist groups. How do you view this? I think this is so close to home to South Africa, perhaps. 
especially to the people who struggle, the ANC, SACP, COSATU, all other organizations who waged a struggle <clears throat> against colonialism as well as apartheid regime here. Mm. Uh, therefore, we are seeing that whenever there is a movement which is against the status quo, when you want to change, when you want to make use of the right to self-determination of a people, yes, you're automatically branded that because you go against the, the, the official policies uh, of the world and regional powers. So this is not something that was not unexpected. However, what we're seeing at the moment is the fact that a hundred years of Kurdish denial is being shattered and Abdullah Hajalan and the PKK has a huge role in this, um, in its last 40 years of struggle. Yeah. So as this denial policy is shattered and the Kurds are, are becoming more visible in, in the countries that they were partitioned in, so they are not surrounded actually, they are partitioned into Iraq, Iran, Syria and Turkey, we are seeing that the label of terrorism, not only on the PKK, but also on the KDP and the PUK, is being shattered much more. I wanted to ask you about the support for ISIS. It seems that they are supported by significant forces. Do we know who they are and how the support network works? Well, this is really no secret anymore. Um, you know, the true, the, the upfront forces that are seen to be behind them is, is Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Turkey. Uh, however, everybody knows that the U.S. and the West has had a long-term and traditional policy to do their proxy war um, through such organizations. Uh, uh, therefore, because one cannot rule out how the U.S. and the West is, is supporting Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey, in the region, and we know that everyone who was against the Syrian regime was supported in any way, disregarding what this would bring actually to the people uh, of that region, of those lands. Because what we are seeing is an uprooting of, of people such as Ezidi and Kurdish people, Kurdish people in, in Syrian Kurdistan in general, a Syrian Christian, Turkmen Shias. So we're they're, make, they're trying to homogenize the region, you know. So yeah. it's, their name suggests this. It's, it's an Islamic state. It's a yeah. Sunni state. So this is what they are trying to do. And in the meantime, the worst off is the ordinary people, really. Let's look at it. Have they attacked any of the states? You know, yeah. it is the people who are within that region which wants to be cleansed. So it's, a, it's an assault it's an assault on the people on the ground. But I want to talk about why you are in South Africa now, if we can move on. Uh, you are here yeah. to, to ask for support uh, for the release of Abdullah Ocalan. Just give us a bit of background on Ocalan and this cause. Sure. Abdullah Ocalan and a handful of his friends, and they were all students back in the 1970s, decided to look into you know, who they were, what they were, because if you would understand, this, the, the partition of Kurdistan was not only a regional thing, and it was an internationally, it was as a result of an international agreement. Therefore, the denial of Kurds and Kurdistan ran very deep. And when Öcalan and some of his men, male and female friends uh, began organizing and questioning the status quo, they faced, of course, very harsh realities. And um, so from that point on, where it was even prohibited to mention that you were Kurdish, we are at a stage where this denial policy is shattered. But of course, there has been huge um, price paid for this. Öcalan was captured, abducted in Kenya back in 1999 on his way to South Africa, actually. No to ask for advice from the late Honorable Nelson Mandela. And ever since then, he's been in an island prison. But he has had a tested relationship by the Kurdish people and by the events, which are, as you would uh, also um, attest, that very complicated political events occur in the Middle East. But he was able to steer the Kurdish people to today, where all these denial policies are shattered. 
Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, that is the Freedom Initiative's uh, Javin Gunesa joining us live from our studios in Cape Town, giving us a little bit of insight into a unique scenario playing itself out in the Middle East right now. Let's take a look at what you're talking about on social media here uh, on the African continent in South Africa. Positive since 89 says, sadly, our taxi owners are t- treating taxi drivers, make them no different from the corporatocracy's attitude towards the people. Nyanga protest is talking about, of course, those buses that were burnt there yesterday. Princess Letsi the eighth says, why people destroy property when they are protesting beats me because soon after they are going to need the same property. Hashtag Nyanga talking about this that we saw playing out yesterday. That was just awful, if you ask me. Burning the buses. Who uses the buses? The people use the buses. Sunisa says, Nyanga, the remains of a Golden Arrow bus at the Nyanga bus terminus. Two buses have been set alight there. Yeah, at last count, it was six buses. What a terrible picture to look at. It really defeats the purpose of what we're trying to achieve when we burn and destroy our own facilities. Let's take a look at what's on our Facebook page right now. Today, there you will see that preparations for the reburial of anti-apartheid journalist Nat Nakasa, who died 50 years ago while exiled in the U.S., are at an advanced stage now. Nakasa will be reburied on September the 12th. You will also see that Telecommunications Minister Siabonga Kwele says plans to equip essential service officers with the latest technology to improve service delivery are in place. And that the World Bank says the world's disastrously inadequate response to West Africa's Ebola outbreak means many people are dying needlessly. You can find all of these stories and lots and lots more on our newsroom Facebook page. That page page is alive and we keep it updated almost up to the minute. Now, today in history, remember Dr. Christian Barnard, world-famed medical pioneer who performed the first heart transplant operation. He died 13 years ago today. Barnard died after an acute asthma attack in his hotel room on the Greek island Cyprus. He was on holiday at the time of his death Krutiskir Hospital was placed center stage in the world spotlight when Barnard performed the first human heart transplant on the 3rd of December 1967. Sadly, the patient only lived for 18 days, succumbing in the end to pneumonia. His new heartbeat was beating strongly right until the end. Who can forget that famous quote of uh, Dr. Barnard at the time in his best English? The heart is but a pump. That's what he told the world at that time. You're watching Newsroom. We'll be back after a short break. where no one's gone. Here with Newsroom on SABC News, let's just take a look at the top stories this morning. The city's Prime Minister could return home today after three days in exile in South Africa. Regional mediators are seeking to reinstall him to power after an apparent coup on the weekend. Factions in the Mountain Kingdom have now agreed to a roadmap to normalize the political situation. The Sadiq Troika announced the breakthrough in Pretoria after a marathon meeting to assist parties in finding common ground. 
The Farlem Commission of Inquiry resumes in Centurion Pretoria this morning with lawyers for the families of the deceased cross-examining London Platinum Mine Head of Security, Hayley Blow. The commission is investigating the deaths of 44 people at the mine in Marikana in the northwest during an unprotected strike in August 2012. Then the Ceruti Commission former chairman of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts, Gavin Woods, is expected to testify at the Ceruti Commission of Inquiry today. Woods, who was an Inkata Freedom Party MP, resigned from his position as chairman of the Key Watchdog Committee in 2002. News in Africa, Liberian President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf says the situation over the massive Ebola outbreak in her country remains grave. In a recent interview, Sirleaf admits that her country's health delivery system is under stress. This while nurses at Liberia's largest hospital went on strike yesterday, demanding better pay and equipment to protect them against the epidemic. More than 1,500 people have died from the highly infectious virus since March. Then lastly, international headlines, the United Nations has agreed to send investigators to Iraq to examine crimes being committed by Islamic State militants on unimaginable scale. The UN announced yesterday that at least 1,420 people were killed in Iraq in August, but that the casualty figures could be far higher because could no, they could not independent verification of reports of hundreds of incidents in Islamic under state, Islamic State's control. Remember, all these top stories are available on our Newsroom Facebook page. You can also follow us on Twitter at SBC Newsroom. Evan, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Katrina. Now, finally, we ask this question. Should e-tolls be scrapped and a few levy be introduced? Or is it time for Gauteng's motorists to simply put their hand in the pocket and pay up? This is what the advisory panel on e-tolls is currently faced with. After more than a billion rand in toll fees has not been paid by those using the province's freeways. Today, we are joined by Consulting Engineers South Africa's CEO, Mr. Lefadi Mkibinyane. CESA is a representative body which represents more than 500 consulting engineering firms in the country and says a fuel levy is not an effective means of funding improvements to freeways. We are also joined by Howard Dembowski from Justice Project South Africa who says ETOLs in Gauteng will cripple South Africa's economy and create a socio-economic disaster in the medium to long term. That is. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Yvonne. Good are the are the gloves off? <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> bare knuckles. <laughs> let's uh, let's uh, let's start with uh, with Cesar. Uh, thank you for joining us. Good morning to you, sir. Why do you say a few levy will not be an effective means of funding etals? Yeah, uh, Yeban. Um, I, th- I think uh, we are grappling uh, with the you know the requirements of infrastructure in this country. Uh, we have taken, um, you know, a decision um, as, uh, as South Africa uh, to implement the National Development Plan. And we said the only way to catalyze the National Development Plan is through the infrastructure development. And the infrastructure development will unlock, uh, you know, this needed economy and, uh, you know, reduce the unemployment and grow the economy of this country. So if you look at the e-tolls, uh, the e-tolls is a very good mechanism. Uh, to actually ensure that uh, private sector um, uh, participation is attracted into uh, infrastructure, bulk infrastructure development of the country. The fiscus is just not sufficient uh, uh, to, to, to really do both social and, and economic infrastructure. So you have to categorize your infrastructure uh, from both uh, the economic and the, and the social. So the, the, so the economic one, which uh, it also uh, tend to uh, fall under that category. It can only be funded uh, through private sector funding. And that is exactly what Sandral has done, to actually go and uh, source uh, private sector funding to upgrade the roads so that the people of Gauteng and the people of South Africa can actually enjoy uh, free, speedy roads. And we can bring this infrastructure at a speedy road, at, at, at a speedy pace. Because remember, if you, if you rely upon uh, the taxes... Uh, that uh, have got to be distributed for whatever the country needs. Uh, it will take a, a lifetime to actually put our roads uh, into the status at which it is. So this is a, a very innovative mechanism to accelerate uh, you know, uh, the, the infrastructure development. Howard? 
I know that you have the alternative view. Please share it with us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I'd like to question this, this uh, assertion that um, the fuel levy is inefficient, that the fuel levy doesn't collect any money. It's only collected 267-odd billion rand over the last 10 years, according to SARS. There have been arguments um, to the effect that the fuel levy cannot be ring-fenced. However, contrary to what was said by your organisation last week, the RAF does not receive 5% of the fuel levy. The RAF receives 1 rand and 4 cents per litre of fuel sold in South Africa. And the calculation that was presented was only around about 21.4 billion rand out in a single year. Now, fact is this. E-tolling is a some users pay principle. And I'll tell you why I say that. For so long as a person can drive upon these freeways and not pay, and let's face it, more than 1.3 million people are not paying. Uh, that is quite clear in the income that is coming in to Sanral at the moment. If it was efficient, they wouldn't have anything outstanding at all. The fact is that if you have a choice, and that choice is I'm not going to pay, then some people are going to take that choice. Additionally, I'd like to just point out that it is highly unconstitutional for South Africa to assert that we're going to prosecute South Africans for driving on these roads and not paying, whilst we're going to allow people who come in from foreign countries like Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Namibia, etc., drive on these freeways, return to their homes without paying. The fact is that the fuel levy is very efficient. And I'd like to ask a very simple question of you. When last did you hear of anybody going to a fuel attendant and saying, you've just filled up my motor car, I've done the calculation, two rand and 24 and a half cents is the fuel levy, one rand and four cents is the RAF levy, on each litre of fuel, I'm deducting that from the amount I'm paying you. It's never, ever happened. It never, ever will happen. So let's just do ourselves a favour and leave what belongs in Europe in Europe and continue with things that actually work in South Africa. We can introduce something called a national roads levy and be done with it. And in fact, Tomorrow, the fuel price is going down, I believe, by 57 cents per litre. 67. 67. So there you are. Call me a liar for 10 cents. We are asking for 14 cents per litre in order to pay off this monstrosity that's been built, which, quite frankly, didn't need the Christmas lights or anything like that. We could have very easily instituted 14 cents a litre and paid it off quicker. The next question then to you, sir, is... Are you happy that ETOLs, the paying mechanism works and that the system can, can deal with the volumes that is required for, for it to be successful? Yeah, um, you, you will understand that, you know, um, I'm not here probably, I must make it uh, very clear, I'm not here to, uh, um, you know, to represent uh, Sunra. Yeah. I'm here to represent the principal. Correct. And I'm saying that, you know, this is the country that is overstretched. You know, 50% of our people are living below poverty line. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and we are saying that, you know, the government must up up its game as far as infrastructure development is concerned, together with the private sector. The, pub, the private sector must come to the party. Currently, we are having a plan. The National Development Plan calls upon, uh, you know, if we have to achieve the objective of the, of the, national, of the national Development Plan by 2030, yeah. This country requires 28 trillion rand. So, and, and for us to achieve that, the government has got to up up its performance. Currently, they are spending about 7.6% uh, of the GDP towards infrastructure development, Cape expand. The private sector is spending around 13% of the GDP. To achieve those objectives, the government has got to up up its performance to 10% of the GDP. The private sector has got to up up its performance to 20% of the GDP. That's the only time that we will unlock. And remember, that plan, what is meant to do? 
yeah. is to ensure that you know we we reduce unemployment in this country to a level of 6% by 2030, is to ensure that we triple our economy by 2030, is to ensure that you know, this inequity that is so glaring is actually eliminated. So we're building a society here. So, and and the, the, the private sector, unfortunately, they require certainty on the side of government on how is, uh, things are done. So if private sector money is going to come into, into, into the infrastructure, there must be certainty of laws of ensuring that they recover their investment. And the e-toll is a mechanism. Yeah. Re re remember what is actually happening with the e-tolls. If you look at the e-tolls, people must just observe as they enter the freeway. If you are a, 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 a licensed driver, you will know the coding. Blue means freeway. Green means national or local yeah. uh, roads. So it's important that alternative roads are there for people to utilize. So if you don't want to pay, please, you know, utilize alternative you, routes. You, and then <laughs> before, and, and, before you go, yeah. before you go uh, uh, yeah. uh, Howard, I'd like to ask you this question. You mentioned about this 10% increase that government needs, government specifically Absolutely. needs. Where do you get that 10%? Because it seems as if the middle class is already stretched in this country to the limit. So where do you get that 10% then and maintain the harmony within the country? No, you know, you, you, you will get that 10%. All, all what we are saying is that the government already, they will tell you that they have spent uh, over a trillion over the last five years. And, uh, and they are currently, um, you know, the keep expand or the, the capital fixed formation. It's about 847 billion rand that they have to spend on the infrastructure in the next... Uh, where you know, do we get it, is my, is my question. You get it through, you know, where does, where does the government get the money? By squeezing taxation, us. Sir. No, no, you know, by what? By taxation, by uh, investment, etc., etc. Absolutely, but, that, is, that is what we are saying, that we are already stretched. But there are private investors that will come into, into the party yeah. to accelerate our development. If we, if we fold our arms and say, no, we are already fully stretched and therefore nothing will happen. Yeah. Look at the, what is happening in the, with the national roads or prov provincial roads in, in particular. You know, look at uh, the disrepair, the potholes that are there, you yeah. know, and, and, and even on the local network. Look at the, the conditions of roads that are resulting into deaths that we cannot actually even yeah. start to, to count. We are having the mechanisms that will improve the quality of life of our people. And as an engineer, I sit in here and I say that we cannot really uh, 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 inhibit uh, development and bulk infrastructure uh, while there are alternative methodologies to actually speed up the, the development of this country. Howard? Okay. Um, so I, I'd, I'd like to address a couple of things first. As an engineer... Yeah. Um, we, we would assume that, that you know how to use a calculator. The fact is that 1.1 billion rand was outstanding on e-tolls as of 31st of March. The same is not true on the fuel levy. And we are not saying rely on the existing fuel levy despite the fact that the Sanral Act actually says that Sanral is funded by the fuel levy. If you want us to start asking where that 267 billion rand has gone, then we will do that. And we will call for an audit as to exactly where that money has gone. Now, let's talk about unemployment for a second, sir. How exactly are we going to achieve 6% or sub-6% unemployment by 2030 when we have criminalized half of Gauteng's residents. Because, unfortunately, here's a harsh reality that maybe nobody is actually looking at and maybe nobody cares. But when you get a criminal record, your chances of getting employment are zero because all personnel agencies run criminal record checks against people. You therefore create a nation of unemployable people. So my question is, how are we going to achieve these objectives by working against ourselves? And then when we start talking about provincial roads and local roads with potholes in them, are you aware of the fact that the local and provincial authorities get given money by the fiscus to maintain those roads, but that money evaporates because it comes from fuel, of course, and, and doesn't get spent on those roads. I'm, I'm no not, one is saying that the concept of tolling mm. is 
incorrect. Yeah. Nobody is saying that the concept of, of um, Sanral maintaining roads is incorrect. In fact, in our assertions to the panel yesterday, we said things would be considerably eased if Sanral was the only roads agency that is responsible for roads in South Africa nationally. Because then it would be really easy to monitor what's happening to that money. Mr. Makimbinian, you've got 30 seconds to just give us a final remark. We unfortunately run out of time. It's a discussion we can carry on all day. What I, what, what I say that once we have uh, created loss, uh, loss must be followed. Who is actually incurring uh, this uh, 1.1 billion rand is people who are illegally utilizing the roads. Uh, and, sir, and, with and, due respect. And, and, no, no, and no, no. They're paying no. the fuel levy let, too. Let, 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 me, let me tell you. What, uh, what we are saying is that, you know, the, the process has been followed to come and, 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 and to the point of an act. And once the law has been established, <laughs> as an engineer, as an ethical association of consulting engineers, law-abiding, uh, you know, association, we conduct ethical conduct, behavior, and we follow the rules. And the rules of the country must be followed so that people don't find themselves at a disadvantage. Which is Thank very you. easy to say when, when one of your biggest contributors is Sanral and your shoes cost more than my wardrobe. Thank you, sir. Well, on that note is where we conclude today's discussion. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. That is uh, Consulting Engineer South Africa CEO, Mr. Lefadi Makibinyani. And, of course, Hard Demboski from the Justice Project South Africa. Thank you for joining us this morning. That's where we leave it. Newsroom is broadcast live from our studios in Auckland Park, Johannesburg, every weekday morning between 9 and 10 a.m. The show repeats at 2 in the afternoon with a rebroadcast at 5 a.m. the following morning. We also stream live on YouTube at that time with the whole show available on demand all of the time on our YouTube channel. This is SABC News. You've been watching Newsroom. We just love it in the morning.